Have you ever wondered what the real purpose of a prison is? Is it to punish or to rehabilitate? This question has sparked countless debates and discussions throughout history, and the answer, it seems, continues to evolve. Prisons have been a part of human societies for centuries. They originated as simple holding cells for individuals awaiting trial or punishment, often in the form of public humiliation or physical harm. The concept of incarceration as a form of punishment itself, however, is relatively new, tracing its roots back to the late 18th century. This evolution in purpose was driven by a shift in societal attitudes. The Enlightenment, a period of intellectual and philosophical development, brought forth ideas of human rights and dignity. It challenged the view of prisoners as mere wrongdoers deserving of physical suffering. Instead, it proposed that they are individuals who have strayed from societal norms and need guidance to find their way back. Fast forward to the present day, and prisons are now seen as institutions that should serve dual purposes, punishment and rehabilitation. The punishment aspect, often termed as retribution, aims to deter potential criminals and provide a sense of justice to victims. On the other hand, rehabilitation seeks to reform inmates, equipping them with skills and attitudes to reintegrate into society as law-abiding citizens. However, striking a balance between these two purposes is a complex and contentious issue. Some argue that the focus on retribution has led to an era of mass incarceration, with little attention to rehabilitating inmates. Others contend that prisons are too lenient, providing criminals with amenities and opportunities they might not have had outside the prison walls. The debate between rehabilitation and retribution is not merely academic. It shapes our prison systems, influences public policy, and impacts countless lives. As we delve deeper into this topic over the next few scenes, we'll explore both sides of this debate, the effectiveness of rehabilitation programs, and the broader impact of our current prison system on communities. As we delve deeper into this topic, ask yourself, should prisons primarily punish or rehabilitate? Let's first examine the argument for retribution, the idea that punishment should fit the crime. At its core, retribution is a principle grounded in the concept of justice. It's the belief that a person who commits a crime should be penalized in proportion to their offense. This, proponents argue, serves two primary functions. First, it's seen as a deterrent. By enforcing strict penalties for criminal actions, society signals a clear message to would-be offenders. The message? Commit a crime, and you will pay the price. This creates a kind of psychological barrier, a fear of punishment that can dissuade individuals from breaking the law. Second, retribution is viewed as a form of justice for victims. It's an assurance that the perpetrator will not walk away unpunished, providing a sense of closure and vindication for those who have suffered. However, the retributive approach is not without its critics. Detractors argue that this method focuses too heavily on punishment, neglecting the root causes of criminal behavior. They contend that by simply punishing offenders without addressing underlying issues like poverty, addiction, or mental health problems, we're merely putting a band-aid on a systemic issue, rather than offering a solution. Moreover, there's a question of fairness. Is it just to mete out punishment based solely on the crime committed, without considering the circumstances or context in which it occurred? Critics of retribution argue that this approach lacks nuance and fails to take into account the complexities of human behavior and society, and then there's the issue of efficacy. Despite the belief that punishment deters crime, studies have shown that harsher penalties do not necessarily lead to lower crime rates. In fact, countries with the most punitive justice systems often have higher rates of recidivism, suggesting that retribution might not be as effective a deterrent as its advocates believe. So the question remains, does retribution truly serve justice, or does it merely feed a cycle of crime and punishment? As we delve further into this topic, we'll explore these questions and more, shedding light on the complex and often controversial world of prison reform. Now, consider the other side of the coin. Rehabilitation, the process of helping inmates reintegrate into society. At its core, rehabilitation is based on the belief that individuals are not inherently criminal. Instead, it posits that circumstances, experiences, and personal issues often lead to criminal behavior. As such, it advocates for providing inmates with the tools they need to overcome these challenges, ultimately reducing the likelihood that they will reoffend upon release. This approach is far from a one-size-fits-all solution. It involves a wide range of programs tailored to the unique needs of each inmate. This could include therapy for mental health issues, substance abuse programs, educational and vocational training, and even life skills courses. 
The goal is to equip inmates with the means to lead a productive and law-abiding life once they leave prison. Rehabilitation also extends into the community. Post-release supervision and support services are crucial to ensuring that former inmates can successfully navigate the transition back into society. This might involve helping them find housing and employment, or providing them with ongoing counseling and support. Critics, however, question the effectiveness of these programs. They argue that not all inmates are capable of change, and that rehabilitation can sometimes be seen as an easy way out. Furthermore, they contend that the resources spent on rehabilitation could be better used elsewhere, such as on crime prevention or victim support services, but proponents of rehabilitation counter these arguments with evidence of its success. Numerous studies have shown that inmates who participate in rehabilitation programs are significantly less likely to re-offend compared to those who do not. This, they argue, not only benefits the individual, but society as a whole by reducing crime rates and the associated costs. Yet despite these promising results, rehabilitation remains a contentious issue. It challenges our traditional views of justice and punishment, forcing us to confront difficult questions about the nature of crime and the purpose of prisons. The debate continues, does rehabilitation truly reduce crime, or does it merely absolve criminals of their actions? One of the major issues in this debate is mass incarceration, but how does it fit into the rehabilitation versus retribution argument? Mass incarceration is a term that refers to the extraordinarily high rates of imprisonment, particularly in the United States. This phenomenon began in the 1970s, when a series of law and order policies resulted in a dramatic increase in the number of people behind bars. The reasons behind mass incarceration are complex, ranging from the war on drugs to mandatory minimum sentencing laws, and even the privatization of prisons. However, the effects of mass incarceration are clear and far-reaching. Families are torn apart, communities are decimated, and the cycle of crime often continues unabated. It's an issue that disproportionately affects marginalized communities, further entrenching socioeconomic disparities. Let's link this back to our ongoing debate on rehabilitation and retribution. In the context of mass incarceration, a retributive approach could be seen as perpetuating the problem. With a focus on punishment rather than reform, the cycle of crime and imprisonment continues, leading to even higher incarceration rates. On the other hand, a rehabilitation approach could potentially break this cycle. By providing inmates with the tools they need to reintegrate into society, such as education, job training, and mental health services, we could reduce recidivism rates and, in turn, alleviate the issue of mass incarceration. As we can see, the issue of mass incarceration adds another layer of complexity to this debate. A major point of contention in this debate is the effectiveness of rehabilitation programs. Do they really work? The question is not as straightforward as it may seem. What do we mean by work? If we measure success by a reduction in reoffending rates, then yes, many rehabilitation programs have shown promising results. For instance, the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that two-thirds of released prisoners were rearrested within three years. However, those who had undergone rehabilitation programs had significantly lower rates of reoffending. But let's dig deeper. The RAND Corporation, a global policy think tank, conducted a study showing that inmates who participated in correctional education programs were 43% less likely to return to prison within three years than those who didn't. That's quite a significant difference. Another study, done by the Minnesota Department of Corrections, found that prisoners who completed its MNTC program, a faith-based rehabilitation initiative, had 26% lower recidivism rates than the general prison population. These findings suggest that rehabilitation programs can indeed work. They can reduce reoffending, ease the transition back into society, and ultimately decrease the overall prison population. But it's not all sunshine and roses. Rehabilitation programs have their limitations too. Not all prisoners are eligible or willing to participate. Some may not have the mental or emotional capacity to benefit from these programs. Others may simply not want to change. Moreover, the effectiveness of these programs can heavily depend on the quality of implementation. Poorly run programs may not only fail to rehabilitate, but could potentially exacerbate existing issues. It's like trying to fix a broken bone with a band-aid. Additionally, rehabilitation is often a long-term process. It requires investment in time, resources, and manpower. This can strain already tight correctional budgets and manpower. 
Lastly, it's important to remember that rehabilitation programs are not a one-size-fits-all solution. Each individual is unique with their own set of circumstances, experiences, and needs. What works for one may not work for another. So, do rehabilitation programs really work? The answer seems to be a cautious, yes, but it's not a magic bullet. It requires commitment, resources, and a tailored approach to each individual's needs. While rehabilitation programs have shown promise, their success is not guaranteed. The debate continues. Finally, let's consider the impact of the prison system on communities. How does the balance between rehabilitation and retribution affect society? When we talk about retribution, we're essentially referring to punishment for wrongdoing. On the surface, this may seem like a natural response to crime, but let's delve a little deeper. When a community experiences high rates of incarceration, it can lead to an array of social issues. Families are broken apart, children grow up without one or both parents, and the cycle of crime often continues, perpetuating a culture of retribution. Moreover, the stigma associated with imprisonment can make it challenging for ex-offenders to reintegrate into society. They often face difficulties in finding employment and housing, which can lead to recidivism or a return to criminal behavior. This ripple effect of retribution can create an ongoing cycle of crime and punishment, impacting communities for generations. Now, let's switch gears and discuss rehabilitation. Rehabilitation programs aim to help offenders change their behavior, equipping them with the skills and resources necessary to lead productive lives post-release. This approach has the potential to break the cycle of crime, providing individuals with a second chance and reducing recidivism rates. The impact of rehabilitation on communities is profound. When individuals are rehabilitated and reintegrated, they can contribute positively to their communities. Families can be reunited and the social fabric can be mended. There's also an economic benefit as individuals find employment and contribute to the economy rather than being a financial burden on the state. However, it's important to acknowledge that rehabilitation is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It requires tailored programs, support systems, and ongoing commitment from the community and the individuals involved. But the potential benefits to society are undeniable. The impact of the prison system extends far beyond the prison walls. The balance between rehabilitation and retribution has profound effects on our society. As we've seen, the debate between rehabilitation and retribution is complex and multifaceted. In the course of this discussion, we've navigated the murky waters of the prison system, unearthing some unsettling realities and provocative questions along the way. We delved into the purpose of prisons, unveiling the dichotomy and perspectives. Some see prisons as places of retribution, a response to the age-old principle of an eye for an eye. They argue that prisons serve to deter potential offenders and provide justice for victims. Yet, others view prisons as a platform for rehabilitation, a chance for individuals to reform their ways and reintegrate into society as productive citizens. The issue of mass incarceration was brought to light, revealing a startling number of individuals caught in the clutches of the prison system. The scale of this phenomenon raises questions about the effectiveness of our current approach and whether we're striking the right balance between punishment and reform. We examine the effectiveness of rehabilitation programs, finding that while they're not a one-size-fits-all solution, they can significantly reduce reoffending rates. Yet these programs are often underfunded and overlooked, despite their potential benefits not only for individuals, but for communities and society at large. Speaking of communities, we explored how they bear the brunt of the prison system's failures, the ripple effects of mass incarceration extend far beyond prison walls, impacting families, neighborhoods, and entire communities. The societal cost of our current approach is high, reinforcing the need for a more balanced and thoughtful strategy. Ultimately, the question remains, what is the true purpose of a prison? Is it to punish or to rehabilitate? As you ponder this question, remember the complexities and nuances of this debate. Let's continue this conversation seeking solutions that respect the dignity of all individuals, that prioritize justice over vengeance, and that build communities rather than breaking them apart.